507, you are listening to The Music Box on Vocalo 91.1 FM. I'm your host, Jesse Menendez. The song that you just listened to were Dragon's Dream from Vagabond Maurice. On his album, The Dragon That Devoured the Moon, Chicago-based poet and MC Vagabond Maurice creates a narrative that explores what he calls nerd mythology as well as blackness and exploration. All of this over buttery, soft, soulful samples reminiscent of the work Guru created with Jazzmatazz and West Coast Hip Hop Collective Hieroglyphics did with their catalog. And of course paying nods to the likes of Diggable Planets. Joining me in studio, Vagabond Maurice. Mr. Maurice. Yes, yes. Like it, man. Yeah, I wow. dig it. Thank you for that intro. That was really smooth. <laughs> You're the one who made the music, my man. All, it, it's nothing for me to describe it. And even then, I don't think I did it justice. Oh, man. You're originally from Minneapolis. Yes, yes. Is this where you became acquainted with hip-hop and poetry? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I was... Actually, I'm the first generation born here in America. My parents are from Liberia, and they moved to Minnesota. So I was born there, and uh, I got acquainted with hip-hop through my pops, actually, because uh, he was a DJ and a nurse. So, like, he played the field. He was a DJ. He was a nurse. He was also, like, a photographer. He was, like, a renaissance man. A so, Liberian DJ slash nurse spinning hip-hop in Minnesota. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what he was. So, like, you know, I had all types of jazz just playing uh you know throughout the house that and like you know um a lot of stuff i grew up with a lot of stuff that he grew up with which was just like a lot of like african roots yeah. and things like that so then your introduction to music wasn't necessarily hip-hop first like you just said you know was spinning a lot of jazz records yeah what were those artists oh man so my pops he spins a lot of the greats right like charlie parker you know uh miles davis uh coltrane nina simone uh, it's like a, it was a multitude of just like, you know, I would say more atmospheric sounding uh, jazz just to play around the house while yeah. he was like making us clean or like <laughs> <laughs> while we played, you know. <laughs> sure, sure. So you can forget that you're doing chores. Yeah. Put your mind at ease with some Nina Simone. <laughs> And clean the bathroom while you're doing it. Right, exactly. On this album, there are a number of number of things that you're looking to do. We'll get into the narrative in just a second. But one of the things that you were hoping this album did was serve as a vehicle for you to explore blackness. Yes. Talk about that. Yes. I mean, you know, growing up, uh, you know, for me and a first generation born here in America, just like growing up, you, you get that whole dichotomy between like being African and then being African American, right? And like, it, it took me a while. First of all, it took me a while to, uh, you know, accept things like my my dark skin. You know, self love, and that's like a lot of things that I explore throughout the uh, the LP. Is like me uh, accepting myself, accepting how much work I've put in as like a writer in general, and just like you know, exploring blackness and what that means and what it means to like you know, love the melanin of your skin. As and who gets to it. control it and define it, right? Right, exactly. You know, so it's just like. You have, to, you have to discover that for yourself, you know? And that's what a lot... Like, this whole LP was catharsis for me, essentially, you know? Well, like, what, what was the conclusion that you came to? People listening are like, what is oh, the definition of blackness? The definition of blackness is beauty. <laughs> the definition of blackness is beauty. It's, it's beauty. It's rebellious. It's a, it's a form and culture of art that cannot be ignored. Yeah. And that's blackness. And I ask this because, as you're probably aware of, there's been a movement called New Black. <laughs> Are you not familiar with this? No, I am. Okay, what are your thoughts on that? You, you just you just think it's hilarious. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, it is, it is. Like, truth be told, ah, uh, it's so funny because I just ah, uh, like I thought he was laughing because I was the first person to bring it up and no, he had never heard of this. But apparently, no, it's just... not not at all. I actually wrote a poem about this like uh like a couple months ago uh, about the whole this new black quote unquote movement, where it's just like does it doesn't matter how uh. <sighs> It's like you get up to the social status, right? But you cannot forget your roots. Like, no matter what, no matter who you are or how much you attain, like, there's, you know, a lot of systematic things put in place for people who are lighter that will, you know, benefit them. You cannot deny that. Yeah. You cannot deny that. So this whole, yo, it's not about skin tone, blah, 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 this, that, and the third. It's just like, gee, you, you too far from the source right now. Come back to us, G. Just come back. <laughs> <laughs> rain it in, rain it in. Right? So tell me, because a lot of the way you talk about some of these issues in your music is metaphorical. It's not as explicit mm. as you and I are discussing it right now. Yeah. Talk about the way in which you wanted to explore blackness and how you did it with these characters and these narratives. Well, the way that I really explored it, uh, 
I mean, my whole like background of writing comes from like Shakespearean, you know, reading stuff like that, and also like essentially Saul Williams, right? Saul Williams is a poet. Uh, well, you, you're like, yeah, I know, <laughs> but yeah, so like reading and like listening to Saul Williams and like that whole uh, Afrofuturistic, uh, you know, notion of uh, just just like the narratives of it, you know, because like I grew up uh, reading and playing. RPG video games, Japanese RPG video games that like had to do like with like dystopias and stuff like yeah. that. So of course that whole narrative like sank into the way that I started writing. You know. Yeah, I'll never forget. By the way, having Saul Williams sit right across from me in this very studio. Oh, nice. We were talking about political development, political ideologies, yeah. and then the conversation went to hip hop, and he said one of the dopest things, and I will always remember this because I was just talking about socio-political issues mm. uh, the type that you would see maybe on a cnn or what have you but yeah. he said just hip-hop on its own he's like there's nothing more political than a black man a young black man mm. standing up to america talking about their own life and saying what exactly and i thought that was the yeah. dopest thing because i was talking about a more of a surface level political thing mm. you know, oh and he was like no this yeah. just existing yeah is politicized which i thought was really dope oh definitely i definitely agree with that the dragon that devoured the moon, you kind of mm -hmm. just alluded to how this comes into play, the dragon, the imagery, the Shakespearean studies, as well as the Japanese anime and video games. Yeah. You also name these songs in yeah. Japanese as well as in English. Yeah. Why the dichotomy there? The right, duality. So, mm -hmm. so du the duality in that is, uh, this is going to reveal a lot, because a lot of people have asked me this. So each Japanese prefix before the song title mm -hmm. is uh, a phase of the moon in Japanese. So, uh, right, if you go back and you're like, I was doing a lot of, like, meticulous, like, research artsy stuff while I was making this, you know. And, like, I, I, uh, my research led me to, like, uh, you know, the Japanese language and specifically the, 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 the names they have for each phase of the moon, you know. And, like, I was just reading through it. I was like, wow, would it be cool to prefix this LP, like, chapters of a book and just, like, have it be prefixes this. Here's the title. And if people, people who don't know Japanese, they'll be like, yo, let me go do some Which research. Which is most of us. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it's like, I barely speak it myself. <laughs> Back when <laughs> Maurice wanted none of us to know what he was talking about. You got to do some research, you know? It's like <laughs> it's like when you listen to old school hip hop and like, yeah. you know, you hear a, a, a line that Common drops and you're like, whoa, what is he what is he talking about? And you go back and you look that well, up. Hopefully if Common drops a line, you do the research, mm. one day it'll all make sense. Hey, ooh. 515, you are listening to the Music Vox on Vocal 91.1 FM. We're going to take a break when we come back more with Vagabond Maurice. This is Black Coffee. 519, you are listening to the Music Vox on Vocal 91.1 FM, the track that you are just listening to, Black Coffee, by Chicago-based poet and MC Vagabond Maurice off of his album, The Dragon That Devoured the Moon. Yes, and I have yes. to answer that question because you've already given me the answer. Mm. You know what love is? It's blackness. Yes. Love is blackness. Yes. So you're writing this album... And mm. uh, there are a number of things that you're exploring, self-identity, blackness, what does that all mean? Yeah. And you also touch on nerd mythology. This is what you've called it, nerd mythology, which is an interesting subject because yeah. I think the word nerd has a negative connotation. Mm. It's the other, it's counterculture. Yeah. But I mean, the things that you're outlining here are pretty dope in my opinion. Mm. I collect comics, I collect toys. I don't consider that to be uncool. Right. What is the nerd that you identify as, the definition of that? All right, so the nerd that I identify as is, uh, first of all, it's uh, anime, comic books, video games, right? right? That's a little nerdy. <laughs> it's a little bit, right? <laughs> it's like... I'm like kidding, I actually, I, I, I dig <laughs> video games as well, too. Oh, definitely. You well, couldn't get me off of Final Fantasy VII when that dropped. <sighs> Final Fantasy X was my muse. Yeah? Yeah, that was, like, my, my real muse. See, look at that. See? And it's just, like, growing up, like, things like those were, like, you know, being a nerd and, like, uh, it is it is that that uh, that counterculture, you know? Yeah. Uh, until, like, I would say recently, I feel like it's... It's been adopted. Yeah, it's, like, it's cool to be a nerd. Like, sometimes... Or I, the perception of nerdiness is cool because I think yeah. what it's become is the other. Yeah. No, exactly. Because, like, sometimes I... I talk about like Cowboy Bebop or Dragon Ball Z, and people are like, "Oh, no, exactly." Who's, who's you your character? Well, in Dragon Ball Z, Cowboy Bebop. Okay. So I like Goku. Yeah, Goku. Yeah, Goku. That's like top, top. Goku, Spike Spiegel, like Lupin the Third. I'm out of here. <laughs> 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 so like, I feel like nowadays it's becoming, you know, it's being more accepted, you know, because like I feel like there's 
more nerds coming out like yeah we love this we love this and everyone's like all right well i i guess we gotta we gotta yeah. accept this you know yeah yeah and do you feel that comes through in your music as well the way you present it or is it just um an aesthetical thing uh it no it definitely comes because like it's it's funny because like <laughs> in the whole realm of rapping about being a nerd and dropping these references it's just like there's uh, a big distinction right because sure. like anyone can like have punchlines about goku and being saiyans right but then yeah. on the other hand you can have like uh actually utilizing it in a liter literary sense where it's just like yo this is actually like a metaphor you know for example there's this uh poet named josh who uh utilized the concept of collecting the and seven this dragon dude balls. better be good by the way if he's only going by <laughs> josh such a common <laughs> name <laughs> he's a poet he's a poet uh, with there's, this, there, right? there's this poet named, <laughs> named bill <laughs> Uh, uh, I feel bad because he's probably gonna be like, Maurice, you don't remember my last name?" I'm like, "Yo," but like he he utilized like collecting the Dragon Balls as like you know a, a means to uh, talk talk about like uh, um, this whole uh, it was like a civil war that happened in in Africa, you know, about like uh, you know like trafficking and like people who are dying, and hopefully to if we collect these seven Dragon Balls, his wish would be to wish these people's back, right? Wow. So like, right, exactly. So it's like there's a difference between like utilizing it as your aesthetic and like it's real life. Right. <laughs> and you know, at the very beginning of this conversation, we were talking about some of the things that help formulate you as a writer, and mm -hmm. you mentioned Shakespeare. So I assume then when you approach the pen and pad, it's from a literary sense. Yeah. In the in the way you concoct your schemes and the way you put these these thoughts together. Mm, yeah, I'm a I'm a fiction writer. You know, I went to uh, Columbia College Chicago for fiction writing, right? To get my bachelor's degree in uh, fine arts is what was uh, what was put on the you know the right. stuff. But uh, that's, that's what the receipt says. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. But fiction writing was like that was my muse. That's why I came up. That's that was like the start of me wanting to be a writer, right? And like just the whole performance aspect came from me. Like I used to be a real shy kid. Like I would smile a lot, but I'd be extremely shy. Yeah. But like I would, I would be playing like. Uh, the lead roles in like school plays and stuff and be like just out there like just out there on stage performing and people were like yo Maurice you did good and I'm like oh and I'd like shrink back you know yeah. so uh yeah <laughs> he's smiling now yeah but, <laughs> but, but shrinking back and yeah. suddenly you know again going uh, back to the beginning of this conversation mm -hmm. you were talking about your dad introducing you to some of the jazz greats yeah that was a while ago yeah, you've decided though to let that be your template in terms of what your sonic palette would continue to be. Definitely. How has that been? What you've maintained? Uh it's uh, it's good. It's good. Like it's sound. Like for me, I've been working on this for such a long time. We're like trying to figure out the 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 sound that now that I have it where it is. It's it's because like it's inspired. Uh, my main influence sound wise comes from Nuja Best, right? And Nuja Best is a Japanese producer who uh, was one of the main producers for the anime uh, Samurai Champloo, right? Mm. Uh, so like listening to listening to the Samurai Champloo uh, uh, soundtrack and then discovering Nuja Best and Fat John and like delving deeper into their separate albums, it was just like it it fit, you know? It was like people were spinning their truth, and then like the whole sound left me reminiscent of like when what i listened to when i grew up right yeah. so it's funny because uh the person who produced the first couple of tracks on the lp his name is chinsaku he's in la uh he's he's really inspired by jay dilla while i'm on the nuja best ha uh, half of it right and then we like collided and then everything exploded from there you know so it just it sounds right so. i dig it i dig it you know, listening to the first track and then, of course, the second and the third and diving deeper into this album, it's apparent mm. your foundation, the type of music that you enjoy because it's all over the place mm. in terms of there are fingerprints from here and there and that. Yeah. You also drop references. I mean, there are references to Diggable Planet, so it's a mischief, mm. obviously common. Yeah. Talk about those artists and how that became what you, I don't want to say modeled your schemes after because mm. I don't believe you sound like them, but there yeah. are definitely hints of Butterfly in there. Oh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, well, I grew up listening to Native Tongue Posse, right? And it's just like, uh, so Native Tongue Posse, Native Tongue Posse, uh, Common, Erica Badu, uh, even Kanye West when he came up with College Dropout, and like that led me back to like Talib Kweli and then Most Def, and then like after discovering this uh collective of people making the type of music that I enjoyed, 
yo, I incubated myself in that. Like I fell into that frequency. It was like floating on love. You feel me? Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like growing up with that and having that be instilled with like how I move forward. And it also like, you know, analyzing their lyrics and analyzing their different sounds. It just like helped me, you know, push um, my craft and artistry forward. 526, this is the Music Vox on Vocalo 91.1 FM. I'm Jesse Menendez, my in-studio guest, Chicago-based poet and MC, Vagabond Maurice. Vagabond Maurice, mm-hmm. based on the trajectory you've laid out in terms of where you come from, where mm-hmm. you're at, your lineage, does that have anything to do with how you came up with the name? Oh, actually, my friend, my friend. Because uh, going forward, if yeah. that's not the truth, you should be like, yo, I'm from all over the place. <laughs> right. There's no place I call home. I'm a vagabond. No, like low key, I like I love to travel, you know, and yeah. that's why I moved from Minnesota to Chicago. But the name Vagabond Maurice, my friend from Minnesota, his name is Blong Lee. I call him the Blizzon because he's hilarious. He's an artist. Uh, but he uh, wanted to make this series of like short films about me. He was like, yo, Maurice, I have this concept. It's called The Clarity of Vagabond Maurice. And I was just like, whoa. And at that time, my name was like Flash Fiction or something that like, (laughs) something was so generic, you know? And then it was just like, yo, I just, I wanted my name in my stage name. I go by (laughs) Timothy Storyteller. (laughs) Right? My name is uh, Flash Fiction. I'm going to spit some uh, poetry for you. (laughs) So I was just like, I want my stage name in, I mean, my actual name in my stage name. So I was just like, Vagabond Maurice, let's roll with it. I dig you know? that. I dig that. So we were talking about some of the artists that you kind of surrounded yourself with in terms of what you wanted to be your musical education. Mm-hmm. I mentioned Butterfly. There's also a hint of the Hieroglyphics crew and what you do, Souls of Mischief. Yeah. And I was listening. I was like, yo, this dude kind of spits like these cats in terms of the inner rhymes, the multisyllabics, mm-hmm. the, the rhythm, the melody that you that you convey in your cadence. And then brings a smile to my face when one of the bonus tracks is called 93 to Infinity. Yeah. Yeah. That... Uh, actually, that was uh, so that song, that bonus track was uh, for my homie Vietnam, who uh, passed away. Oh right, yeah, I remember this. Yeah, he passed away. Uh, I want to say two, it was a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, <clears throat> in Madison, Wisconsin, he was saving someone who was drowning, and then he ended up drowning in the process. Right. So uh, John Vietnam is an immaculate MC uh, poet. Uh, first wave official you know and uh kumba links repping just like all around uptown representing just like one of the illest mofos i've ever came across right and like just uh when he passed that was just like it was such a hard time for me you know because like i've been to many funerals right been to many funerals in my life and it was like it was a long time before something like that had happened more than birthdays yeah oh man so when vietnam passed my actually my little bro uh shintendo 64 who's part of my collective he's the one that called me he was like yo maurice vietnam passed and i was in minnesota with my family and so like yeah man it's just it's just it's hard because like after you passed i wrote i wrote that piece that piece is like two years old and then like that verse was supposed to be on the track to me and we're working on and it never came to fruition. So I was just like, I'm going to put this. It has to go on my LP. Yeah. My my man, uh, Leon Trax, laced the instrumental, you know, and we were just like, yeah, let's let's do this. Let's do this. Like, let's do this for, for Vietnam. That's a nice tribute, man. It's a nice it. song. You are listening to the Music Vox on Vocalo 91.1 FM. I'm Jesse Menendez, my in-studio guest, Vagabond Breeze. For more information on anything that we've been discussing, specifically the album The Dragon That Devoured the Moon, you can head on over to vagabondmaurice.bandcamp.com. He's also on facebook.com slash vagabondmaurice. Or you can also head on over to Onsoro, which is O-N-S-O-R-U dot net slash vagabondmaurice. Mr. Maurice, yes, an yes. absolute pleasure. Thank you for the candid conversation. Thank you. From your album, this is Kaleidoscopes on Kerberos. Mm-hmm. 